lesson today. I'm going to be thinking about the challenge of the teenage classroom, something that I'm used to from my teaching in Huckley, and I'm going to be thinking in particular about things that we can do to try to engage teenage students who sometimes perhaps don't always pay a huge amount of attention to us. And I have 10 ideas here, and they are uh, based on how we can use mobile phone photography, some of these in other pictures, and how we can use mobile phones just in their stripped down basic offline function mode. So I call it airplane mode, but it's the kind of thing that you don't need special apps or, or internet for. And then I think my teenage favorite um, in terms of topic is memes, and so I have some ideas for memes as well. It's a little overview of, of what the 10 ideas are here. And these are all things that I've been playing with recently, and I've tried them out recently with my students. And I, I hope that you too will feel free to fiddle with these ideas, modify them to your students uh, and your classmates. Uh, and I really hope that you get some, um, some, some value out of it. I am aware that there are different policies in different countries and in different schools regarding the use of mobile phones. So um, I'm aware that in some situations for free to get students to use their phones in class, in which case sit back and uh, consider this ready to go and easy to use. In other countries, though, that I've been to recently, I'm aware that there is a certain amount of difficulty with using mobile phones. And that's why many of the activities that I'm talking about today um, can be done out of class. They're the kind of thing which uh, just add to the repertoire of tasks that we can use to get students engaged between lessons as well. Okay, if, feel free to give me any comments or any questions that you have in the chat area there. Um, I'm more, more than happy just to uh, carry on talking to myself, but you know, if you have a comment or if there's something that strikes you about a particular activity that you'd like to, to inquire, then just feel free. I'll, keep, I'll be keeping my eye on our chat area, so uh, consider yourself invited to do that. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to launch into the first idea, which is theme words. I, I call it selfie theme words, but it could really just be a photograph of theme words. And what the description of the activities here on the screen, it involves selecting some kind of theme word. And it could be a theme word in relation to something that you have been studying in class. For example, it might be the topic of the unit, of course, but it could be anything. Or it might be something related to the time of year, for example, autumn. And the task is one for students to carry out between lessons. So they have to take a selfie or a photograph uh, outside class in a way that captures for them the meaning of the, uh, the new theme word. Uh, so if we take the word autumn as an example, I think the students can approach this in one of two different ways. On the one hand, you could take a photograph which is which is like a literal or a, a demonstrative uh, meaning of the word as you see it. So, for example, uh, in my photograph here, uh, you can see kind of symbolic images of autumn, which kind of show that you, you one, have an understanding of what the word means, and also that you're prepared to, to share your own impression of the word. But I think a second way of doing it would appeal to students who don't like to be so literal. Um, and you could have something which is more your, your feelings in connection with the word, or the associations that you have in terms of the, the emotions that you experience at this time of year. So that would allow for selfies with facial expressions, perhaps enjoying a warm, hot cup of tea, or kicking through a pile of leaves, or, or something like that. Um, I like this idea of being able to use something which is visual as, uh, as a way of kick-starting the discussion. And this one stays with images. Uh, again, is something which I think is going to appeal to those students who no longer find the given activities in the course book stimulating, to say. So let's take a look at this one, which, which is called Spot the Difference, and let me know what you think. So the instructions, again, are here for you to see. You are working with students in class, and you ask them to get out their phones and to find a picture. Now, it can be dangerous, I think, to ask your students to get their phones out in class. Um, dangerous in the sense that, you know, once the, once the phones come out in a lesson, they usually stay out. It's quite hard to get them away again. So my advice is to, to leave activities like this for the end stages of classes. So when there are five, seven minutes to go, I think that's a good opportunity. That's a good moment to get the phones out, um, unless if you do it before, you run the risk of uh, distracting students in class. Okay, so um, looking at the second bullet point here, uh, the job of the students is to get a photograph that was taken at school. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that most students, if not all students that you work with, do have photographs on their phone, which uh, were taken at school. Uh, and then it's simply a case of deciding on which photo you want to work with, and then doing a recreation of that picture. So on the screen here, you can see a photograph that was taken in a Hungarian classroom. It shows two students who, I guess they're enjoying their, it looks like a geography class, doesn't it? Maybe a calculus, it could be a maths class. This was a photograph that was actually taken uh, by my daughter, my youngest daughter, in that class. And the, the job of DPC is several weeks later, to when you're in the English class, to try and recreate this photograph as accurately as possible. So the students will come up with photographs like this. So you can see, some things have changed. The, this actually, the first picture was taken before the summer holiday, and the second picture was taken after the summer holiday. You can see that the hairstyles are a bit different. The girls have a bit of suntan after the summer holiday. 
And uh, you can also see that the calculator clearly wasn't available for this episode. So they've been a bit more creative here in how they spun the attempt to, to, to the calculator. And the task itself, the idea about comparing the two movies side by side, it's exactly the same thing that I have been doing for 20 years. But when I first began doing activities like this, using photographs or drawings in the textbook, it was less engaging, it was less, it was, it was less meaningful. It would be, you know, just animals in the park, the students would say, the best picture likes two ducks, and the second picture likes three ducks. Um, it's transformed in terms of its interest level when the students are talking about themselves. Um, the, the, the amount of fun that comes from trying to create the pictures yourself as well, I think all adds to the, the motivation to take part and uh, increases the benefit that the students get from taking part. It's enjoy actually looking at those, those two pictures. They did a great job. Okay, staying with photographs and time and staying with images, I wanted to take a look at the third activity, which is a group selfie activity which uses bubbles. Uh, before I do that, I've just noticed there's a question. So, Tatiana, thank you. How do students recreate the photo by asking questions to they see each other's photos? Okay, so they recreate the photo by trial and error. Of course, the first photograph is there on their phones, and so they simply position it up and, and take a, a second version as accurately as they can. If they're not happy with it, they can delete it and try again. So the people in the photograph are allowed to see the original one, and they can take as much time as they need to do a, a replica version of that existing picture, and of course they can see each other's photographs. So the comparison is not an information gap activity, it's simply a, a direct comparison of two pictures. What makes it interesting and different is that this time they themselves feature in the photographs that they're describing. So thanks for that question. And we'll move on now to the group selfie activity. Okay, so looking through your phone, I'm sure that you can see uh, plenty of selfies on there. Here's one on my phone, which is uh, just a random picture of uh, my two daughters. I, and the activity basically is looking at the ways that photographs, selfies can be um, can be embellished with speech bubbles and uh, can have text added to them to uh, relay some information, to answer a question, or to create a link between one and the so in the instructions that I have for this activity, you ask students to answer a question, for example, to demonstrate some language in use. So the example I have here is asking questions with can. Now the students can take a fresh selfie for the purpose of this activity, if that suits your classroom and your needs, or they can just work with the selfie which is already there on their camera roll. And they then get uh, their fingers busy and they add some appropriate text to the selfies uh, to demonstrate the uh, use of can with questions. So here's one one way of doing it, three different ways of adding the question can according to your needs. Now, sometimes you might be wondering, well, how, how, wait a minute, how do you, how do, you do that on a, on a picture, with a picture? How do, you, how do you add text to that? Um, well, there are two, two kind of ways of looking at this. Either you know already how to do this, which is great, um, or you don't know. And if you don't know, it's not a problem at all, because the students that you teach will know for sure they can show you how to do this. Um, and if there is, by some chance, a student who can't do this themselves, then it's a perfect opportunity for here to change. I've certainly found that in my Facebook Messenger conversations with my daughters, I've noticed that teenagers rarely uh, type messages, actually. They're, they're much more into taking a photograph and then adding text on top of it as an extra layer. So I think this is something which is very much in keeping with the means of communicating with each other that teenagers find more creative and more enjoyable than adults. Okay, just to kind of pause here, we've been looking at photographs and talking about sharing these photographs. I'd just like to point out that there are different conventions in different countries about how you can share digital information with students. Um, terms such as Echo, which are particularly good for school-based settings, like social media, but for educational settings, which can be used. Um, I do know that in some countries, things are a bit more lax, and you can use WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups, but I'm imagining here some way, some kind of platform you have with your class for the purpose of sharing images, and that's how you would share the images that you've been talking about so far. Okay, I'm going to pause for a moment, and if anyone has anything they want to, to uh, ask or comment on, feel free. Uh, I'm just going to have a sip of tea while we wait to see if there are any questions. Do you delete all the pictures afterwards? That's a good question. I've never thought about that. Uh, in terms of privacy, in terms of, of making sure that people don't have images of themselves up there which can be further compromised, you mean? And that, that might that might be a sensible thing to do, sure. I'm not quite sure. Okay, so yeah, with with, with, with strict laws come um, tasks that follow the privacy rules or something. Yeah, I can see that in some things necessary in some situations. Okay, um, here's something that I also would like to share with you. The idea of having a selfie prompt. And you have here an example. I did this myself, actually, not with my students, but I did this over the summer. Uh, and it's now something which I'm doing with students because it actually worked really well. So the task is on the screen here. Each student thinks of a question that they would love to get a lot of different people to answer. In this particular case, the question is, what's the best thing that happened to you this week? Individual student, 
who asks the question can choose any question that she or he wants. Now, in the old days, I would have asked students to just do this on paper, to write the question down, pop with the paper, and go around like a reporter and uh, collect the answers. Um, but the way I did this over the summer with this picture that I had was I had a little notebook and I showed it to lots of different people and I asked them to write their answer in the notebook. And I found that there was something really um, inspirational about having a picture that prompted people to write more enthusiastically and quickly in their answer. So this actually is an activity which is both old school, using a notebook to collect information, and also more up to date because it uses a, uh, uses a digital photo as a prompt to get it written into detail. I'm pretty sure that this would work well in a purely digital way as well. If one student posted their picture, then the other students wrote their comments underneath or added further notes, perhaps by responding in kind with an annotated selfie. Um, it certainly occurred to me that there was a uh, real potential to be had in using text and visuals in combination as a way to prompt students to, uh, to get uh, language going uh, and interaction flowing. Um, in terms of using Padlet for this, I have to confess I'm not particularly familiar with the ins and outs of Padlet. Sounds like something that would work for me, for sure. Um, I have brought back various souvenirs uh, to my students and to my uh, children over the years from my travels. Um, this was a year when I decided that instead of buying a t-shirt or buying some chocolate, that I would just collect people's answers in a notebook for my daughter. She's the one who took the profile. And when she got the answers in the notebook, she told me that it was, uh, it was the best present yet. And so there's something really, really quite memorable about approaching uh, tasks in this way. I believe that's needed both in the classroom and also for uh, out-of-school life as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's leave photographs and selfies behind and move on to some other areas. And one thing I'd like to think about now is uh, if you like an, air, an airplane mode uh, feature of a phone is the ringtone because of course your phone isn't going to ring in airplane mode but you can still play the sound you can still have some kind of comparison of what the sounds are. This is an activity that is is an information game. It's a way of using the link between someone's ringtone and their personality as a way to give students a chance to try and guess whose ringtone is whose. The instructions are on the screen and I'm actually going to try this out now. So I have, you get students to record the ringtones uh, of three of their friends or classmates or family members. And of course, we know that some people like to have a kind of personalized ringtone, and that other people like to use the ringtones which are preset on the phones. Um, and you use your own phone to record the ringtones of the three of these people. And then in class, when the students have got their recordings, which they've done between lessons, um, you get each student to give a short introduction about the people whose ringtones they have recorded. The other students predict um, what they think, what kind of ringtone they think each person is going to have, and why. And then you can do a matching task where you play the ringtones and try to match the person to the ringtone. Now, I have uh, a couple of recordings here. In fact, I have three recordings, and I'm going to tell you about two different people. Uh, there's one extra, which is just a decoy. Okay, so one of the ringtones you're going to hear is that of my daughter, and she's 21 years old, and she's a medical student. She uses her phone a lot. And another person whose ringtone you're going to hear is her grandfather, my father. He's retired and he likes traveling and he likes reading. And the third ringtone you're going to hear is just an extra it's a decoy. Okay, so I'm going to play you the three ringtones, and your job is to guess whose ringtone do you think it is. Okay, so here's the first one. Is it uh, my daughter? Is it her grandfather? Or is it the decoy? But it's Was the Indiana Jones theme music. I'm going to type your guesses and I'll post them. Who has the Indiana Jones music? Your grandfather. It's a unanimous guess. Pretty good one. The town agrees. Okay. You're right. <laughs> and uh, it certainly seems to me that personalized ringtones are the kind of thing that all the older generation like to have. Teenagers uh, rarely think that it's cool, so they tend to have the ones on their phones, which are pre recorded, pre loaded. Okay, so the last one, the, the, the block of the one, is the one that my daughter has on her phone. Uh, I think that my students are going to like the, the fun that comes from talking to older relatives and neighbours to get their ringtones uh, collection sounding good here. So I think the uh, grandfather, grandmother's ringtones become in handy for an activity like this. And surprisingly often, actually, it is, it's kind of um, guessable in the same way that they say that people tend to resemble the dogs they have. Perhaps there's something about your ringtone that reveals something. Uh, and again, I notice here that what makes this uh, um, perhaps a, 
most ways prompt for communication or direction is to do something which is based on the everyday lives of a few and so it's something perhaps more meaningful than a few and uh, Before we move away from this question of using words, I, I would like to kind of bring up a, a, bit of a, a bit of a side topic here, I suppose, which is that in our enthusiasm for using activities and phones towards the end of class, of course, there's another issue, which is perhaps the awareness that students use their own phones. The phenomenon of telephone overuse, uh, we certainly find that students are distracted a lot, or they become anxious if they can't look at their phones. If they can't check their notifications for more than 20 minutes, then you might find students are actually itching and very restless. Um, perhaps there is something about how telephones have encroached into our private time, our private lives that is, is worth talking about and worth, worth thinking about. So the next activity is really an activity that works on two different levels. On the one hand, it's a good topic for language practice and simple discussion in class. But on the other hand, if you like, the hidden agenda of the next activity I'm going to show you is really an awareness raising. Uh, the question is, are you guys using phones tonight? And if you think the answer is then what are you doing? I'm going to show you the activity works. Okay, so it's it's black and white screen as well. And the way that it works is it's quite simple. You get students to in class to get a marker, and you you ask them to change the screen display from the normal color to black and white. Grayscale is called. And their task is really simple. You can ask them to keep their mobile phones in black and white for a full day. You're probably thinking, oh, I did, can you do that? <laughs> that was my response when I first heard about it. Is that possible? Can you actually change your phone to black and white? Uh, the answer is yes, you can. Uh, and if you're thinking, well, you know, how do I do that? Then my answer really is, well, you don't, don't ask me because I don't, I don't know myself how to do it. Um, I don't need to know. There's a video on YouTube. There's a video for everything on YouTube. Uh, actually, I suspect that many of your students, if you teach teenagers, actually already know how to do this. Okay, now, what the activity actually involves is going to be coming up in a moment. Um, but I want to kind of preface this by, by saying where the idea came from. The, the idea came from an interview that I uh, was shown with one of the developers of the very first iPhone, a guy who basically said that when they were working on the iPhone, they were particularly careful to make sure that the screen display was as attractive as possible. And he said that they basically were trying to make a, uh, an addictive adult toy, and that they succeeded. They were all young guys, and they wanted to have something fun. Uh, but now, you know, 20 years later, or however long it is, um, these are family men with families and kids, and they see, the guy says he sees his own children addicted to the toy that he helped produce, uh, and he actually regrets that they, they did their job so well in making that mobile phone, that, that smartphone, such an alluring thing to work with. So how can we make it less alluring? And in fact, do we even want to? That's, that's a good question to ask. So the bell rings at the end of the lesson, and your students have their phones in black and white, and they said you have to keep it in black and white and use it for a while. The interesting discussion happens next time you meet the students in the next lesson. And that's when you can actually address some of the issues which are connected to this question of phone use. Things like, okay, so if your phone's in black and white, does it change the way you use your phone? So last students said they found themselves using their phones less as a result, or perhaps it didn't affect their phone use. I think it's also interesting to zoom in on the particular apps and programs that students were using when they were in black and white, and to ask them to write down or discuss in groups uh, which apps felt better to use and which apps felt worse to use. For example, Instagram is, you know, outrageously popular among so many people, but how, how enjoyable is it to look at photographs on Instagram? They're all in black and white. Uh, the same applies, I suppose, to Snapchat and Facebook as well. Um, I tried this out, and I found that when I, I really didn't need my phone, I was longing for not to switch my phone back to color. Uh, and secondly, I found that I did reach for my phone less during the time that it was set to black. Um, if you just look at those two images on the screen, um, it's actually quite hard to keep your eyes on the black and white phone, isn't it? Your eyes automatically move towards the alluring color photograph on top. Um, and I think this is an excellent way to nudge students in the direction of a follow-up conversation, the last point on the side here, which has a kind of open discussion about this issue. Now, I've, I've written a problem here, but I might not want to lead students in that direction, because I have had students who've said, no, it's not a problem, it's just a reality of modern life, and we have phones, we use them. Uh, there might be students who are uncomfortable already with the realization that they're using their phones way too much. And if they don't like this as a solution, well, here's a creative task for them. And you come up with a better way or an alternative way to limit or restrict the amount of time you spend using your phone. And I think that is a really engaging thought for us to give teenage students. And I think that they would appreciate having this opportunity to discuss an issue like this. And I'm also pretty confident that if you gave your students a prompt like this, that they would have some excellent ideas and some excellent opinions about phone use and changes they can make. Um, to give you an example of some other students and uh, what they said, these, by the way, were advanced students. So they were ID2, C1, and they were 16, 17 that I tried this with. Um, some of the ideas they had involved deleting certain uh, apps from the phone's 
of email apps and uh, in particular Facebook app uh, deleting uh, deleting those that was uh, a tip that several students recommended they said they used their phone less and they didn't get the push notifications from their programs when they had to go to the website to see what they did um, I think it's something which is which which is genuinely interesting for them and which leads to uh, useful discussions so so try that hey and you know what actually this is the kind of thing that you might uh, you might not use all the time so you might just save it for your your own life you or in your life uh, uses their phone too much talk about it and maybe maybe try this together uh, and see how you get on with it I think it's, it's fascinating I love this one that I'm going to tell you about now, which is the photo contest. And this is another one which involves uh, sharing a photograph, but it, it works in a, <laughs> in a in a cunning way, if I misdirect the student's eye. Uh, I've done this several times, and I've always had some, just some delightful, um, charming results from it for the students. Um, so again, you ask each student to get their phone out, to open the gallery, and to find a picture, any picture at all that was taken. It could be, be, could be one at school, could be a could be a pet, could be a birthday cake or a coffee or something. Anything at all. Um, students work together in pairs or in small groups, and you just get them to, to show the, the picture to each other. So obviously they choose a picture which they're happy to talk about. And there will probably be some questions like, oh, where's that? Or, hoo -hoo, what's her name? Let's put a cute dog. And there's a chance, obviously, for the kids to, uh, to chat a little bit, uh, to enjoy the photographs that they're uh, being sent off. Okay, and then you intervene after, this, after everyone's got their photograph. Okay, this is the third point of the slide. Uh, and you tell students that this actually can be a photo contest and that it is their job to nominate one of the pictures to the contest. So they have to decide which of the photographs they have has the best chance of winning something in the contest. So they, they basically, basically decide whether the picture of the ice cream cone is a, the best picture or whether the picture of the puppy is the best picture. They choose their picture. So, okay, we have our picture. But here's the twist comes in, because the students haven't yet been told what the theme of the contest is, uh, but they have their photograph ready to enter the contest. So the mm, task is, is really a creative task, trying to make the picture that they've chosen fits the theme of the contest. And the theme of the contest should be something that is unexpected, something which gets students thinking. So I've gone for remembering Michael Jackson as the theme of a photo contest. And suddenly students are thinking, oh, this is impossible. How can we do this? We have a photograph of an ice cream cone or a puppy. What has this got to do with Michael Jackson? Well, that's precisely the idea behind the task. So students have a creative problem to solve. They have to figure out two things. Well, first of all, they have to figure out how their photo, the one they've chosen, how it matches this theme of remembering Michael Jackson. And secondly, they have to sell their photograph to judges, who in this case could be a panel of students or, or you, the teacher. They have to say why they think their photograph is the best photograph for representing some aspect of Michael Jackson's life. And every time I've done this in class, I've found that the student's first impulse is to try and change their picture. They say, oh, this is a terrible picture. Let's try, let's try and find a better picture. Now, of course, they're, they're not going to find a better picture, but that's not the point. The point is, um, it's not about whose photograph is better than whose. It's really about figuring out what you can say about your photograph that is linked to the topic that the teacher is speaking about. Um, and certainly, I can certainly concur that this really is one that gets the students animated uh, and going to task. Now, I want to actually put you in the student's shoes now. So on the next slide, I have four random photographs that uh, were taken from my phone over the last week. I will show you those photographs and encourage you to link them to Michael Jackson in some way. So those are the four photographs. As you can see, there is no apparent Michael Jackson link there. You're going to have to make it yourself. You have a picture of a university student. You have the basilica in Budapest. You have a shopping list. You have the back of a moment, all taken from my phone. Can anybody think of uh, a Michael Jackson connection? Imagine you can use one or, or more of the photographs here. Can you connect them to Michael Jackson in any way at all? If you're there in the, uh, in the, the chat area, you can type your suggestions there if you'd like to. So, Rihanna's idea. Try to fix the modem so you can watch the special on Michael Jackson. We've pre-recorded. Wonderful. We're going to be watching Michael Jackson videos or films all night long, but we have to get the right one first. Delphine, thriller in the dark night. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Behind the basilica, there might be zombies waiting. And Stephanie, I like the way you think as well. You're, I guess you're saying the bizarre ingredients on shopping list could be the ingredients for a Michael Jackson memorial brunch. Wonderful. And so on and so on. One group of students that I, I showed this to uh, last week said that the ingredients on the shopping list, they were the ingredients of the special cream that Michael Jackson used to use on his face. So they were going to re recreate the Michael Jackson face cream. So this is going to work well. Change the topic. Right? Use anything that you think would raise a smile to your students' faces. Uh, it should be a little bit wacky. 
uh, but still doable, still uh, There's an awful lot to be said for this type of online activity because it helps students to get beyond that first impression, which is it's impossible. This, this, this photo has got nothing to do with Michael Jackson. I need a better photo. Which the answer is you don't. You already have one. You just need to think about it. Now, the real reason that I like this activity is the following. Um, students are working in pairs, of course. You've got them into pairs or threes at the start. And you find that at the beginning, when the students are talking about their photographs, you find that the usual differences in ability that you find in those other groups. So the students with best English find it easier to talk about their pictures than the ones who have a lower level of English. But then when you, when you twist the activity by bringing in the uh, Michael Jackson theme, the whole thing shifts. And suddenly, the students who have the most creative ideas, who have the best solutions to the Michael Jackson puzzle, are very often the ones whose English isn't the best. So there's a lovely, genuine opportunity here for peer learning and peer teaching, where the students with the great ideas can borrow the vocabulary from the students who have a higher language, and the students with higher language who didn't have particularly good ideas here are able to benefit from being in the same group as their colleagues with great ideas. And by pooling their creative and linguistic resources, you end up with a really cool learning curve. So this is precisely the kind of open-ended creative activity uh, I think those who work in the field need to develop a deal with this. Okay, and in the time that we have left, I'm going to move away from selfies and photographs, move away from this airplane uh, view, and I'd like to explore another favorite topic of the which are memes. Uh, this is something that I've got a couple of ideas to share with you. Okay, so I might have skipped a slide there. Yeah, so the first um, activity of memes is simply explaining what memes are. And um, usually in these situations, the person in the room who doesn't know much about memes is the teacher. And these people who know lots about memes are the students. So um, basically, if you use social media at all, or especially if you look at websites like Eingag, you'll see you'll be very, very familiar with seeing memes a lot, which are stock images which have text added to them. And they're usually some kind of very, very contemporary commentary on something which is happening either in the, in the country or even in the school. Sometimes you'll find that students in one particular group of the class will be generating memes and sharing them with each other. Now, this first activity is simply helping students to publish a presentation, which gives something, some information about the history and the background of a particular meme. The student's job is on the screen. They have to select a meme, and there are you know, dozens, maybe, maybe even scores, maybe even hundreds of memes out there. Uh, and by doing some research online, students can find the meme they want to talk about. And a lot of these meme sites actually do contain the relevant background information, um, telling you when the meme first appeared, which year, and so on. Uh, and they also give some interesting pointers as to which situations the meme tends to be used in. Students have to make a presentation, a sort of slideshow, uh, which gives some background information and which also explains how the particular meme was chosen is used. Um, the one we're looking at here is, I think, my favorite meme, this adorable boy who uh, seems to be punching the earth to some satisfaction. But actually, if you, if you look closely, this is a, a picture taken on the beach and the sand in Sri Lanka. But his name is Success Kid. And so I want to give you an example of how a student might approach the topic of the success kid. They could go to a website such as knowyourmeme.com to get some background information about the meme they've chosen. If they're going to be talking about success kid, they would find out from this website to start typing its name and information regarding when the meme first appeared. And also from graph showing you how its popularity has peaked and uh, dropped over the years. It's also fun in these presentations to get students to uh, show a few examples of the meme to explain how it's used. Um, in the case of success kid, of course, this is something which we can use uh, to celebrate those wonderful moments in life when things go well. We've got some examples here. We can all relate to this particularly at some stage in difficult days or a difficult week, uh, just one perfect moment where the meme just makes us, makes us want to smile. And when you feel that, that sense of vindication in something, you want to express it and share it with people, you have this to do it. <laughs> the spaghetti wearing one here is certainly one that speaks to everyone in the mission because I think if you ever eat pasta, you should have one. Okay, and then uh, another way of working with memes is something which involves a contest. And let me tell you how this one Okay, so there are programs online called meme generators. And there are lots of them out there. Uh, one such meme generator is uh, on screen here. And the way these programs work is that you can select the image you want, and you, you can add any text at all. So it actually is really interactive, and it means that students can come up with their own meme for this meme, and can add text to the meme that they've chosen. Um, I like to make this as, as 
personal or as bespoke as possible, if you like. And so the content of the meme in this particular case should relate to the class or people who work with it, or to the study materials. So you could, for example, have a meme contest about Nepal uh, in October, and it's a wonderful chance to share those in jokes or those memorable uh, quotations that one of the students said in class or something the teacher did that everyone remembers as being particularly memorable or funny or whatever it might be. Uh, and then when each student has come up with their own particular meme, uh, added the text and saved it, you can then share it in the way that I indicated before using a, an online platform like WordStats and Meme, and then perhaps even print them out and create a gallery and get students to comment to vote for the ones that they think most I made one too. If you have been, if you've been watching this webinar so far, and you wanted to make some notes, then I have thought that rather now you missed your chance. But I'm going to be sharing these slides with you later. I'll give you a link for those of you to download the slides and have a look at them. So we've got a little success here today. So there, because I will share slides with you as well. Okay, and the last of the 10 ideas that I'd like to look at with you involves storytelling. It's, uh, it involves using memes, that class I'm familiar with, to punctuate a story, to provide moments of emphasis to the narrative as it unfolds. And the way that I do this is I prepare my own PowerPoint show and PowerPoint slide deck, which just contains the five slides that students can see. And I select, of course, memes that we have discussed or memes that the students are familiar with. Uh, there are five here on the screen. I'll tell you briefly about these memes in case you haven't encountered them before. The first one is unhelpful high school teacher. And this is the meme of choice that students use to record the frustrating and uh, hypocritical things that teachers say sometimes. So Google that if you want to see some other topics that students encounter. The second one is grumpy cat, which is perfect to express those moments of just bad hair day or everything going wrong. The third one is not bad, which is actually used, of course, in a counterintuitive way to show that you're very impressed with something. The fourth one, challenge accepted, is the archetype of the team meme, which they use as a way of embracing a needlessly reckless challenge, which they are unlikely to be able to perform, which their sheer sense of pride and bravado uh, insists that they carry on with. And the last one is success kid that we've just taken a look at. So the way it works is students get together and are working in small groups or pairs, and they create a story. You, know, you give them a prompt or the first line of the story, so it was a, it was a wonderful Sunday afternoon in Belgium, and then they take it from there. And normally what happens is the, the emotional content of each meme gives the students an idea of something which might have happened. So very often you'll find that the story begins with something dumb that a teacher said in school. Uh, and it continues to an emotion you know, related to that, for example, the grumpy cat. So, so basically you can see that the knowing what the five memes are helps students to get a sense of, of what their narrative is and where it's going. So they can build their story. And then when their story is ready, they stand up and uh, tell it in class using the, the slide deck that we have created here. And when they get to the appropriate point in the story, which involves the emotive content of the meme, they bring up that image. So like I said before, each of these five individual memes is used to punctuate the, the key emotional content of the story. Um, and that's something which, I'm, which works um, really well for motivating those students. I haven't always necessarily responded to storytelling tasks in an enthusiastic way. Okay then, so that really is, the, that really is it. I've gone through the... 10 slides or the 10 ideas with you. I'm going to give you a recap in a moment and then some more information about where you can find more ideas like this. But I am going to pause now just in case you have anything you'd like to ask, uh, any of these activities or any comments that you want to make. I have a little bit of time left so I can deal with any of your, your, your questions or queries before we wrap up. Okay, so while, while you're doing that, I want just to give you a couple of links here. So to make a note of the, um, the website address underneath the thing there, that's where you can download the slides that you're seeing now if you want to have a look, a second look, or if you'd like just to kind of have that to tell you, yeah, then that is something that is it's also great to get feedback if you have gone into class to try some things out and if it worked well and you want to apply that, or if you have an idea for a modification or improvement, that would be great to hear from you. And there are, there are two ways that you can in touch with me. You can get in touch with me through the, the, the blog address that I give you. Um, it's a bit cumbersome though. I think social media actually is really good for, for allowing us to get in touch with each other. Uh, and we're all leaving Facebook like rats leaving a sinking ship. And so Instagram is now clearly the most convenient way to send a message to someone. I'm on Instagram instead to keep up 
So feel free to send me a message there if you'd like to um, get in touch about him. See you today or something as well. So. Okay, Stephanie, you, you have a question. So what would you say is the maximum age for students to enjoy this? Maximum age? Well, I'm, I'm well past my teenage years. I love this kind of stuff. So I think there's no maximum age, really. Um, it's a silly sense of getting a feel for the particular group of students that you're working with, maybe testing the waters with a few topics, and then developing those ideas with those groups who are responsible for that group. Um, I've, I've used the term teenage students as a kind of basket term for the groups that I think this works with, simply because if you look at this demographically in terms of who the ones who cell phones the most for things like selfies and turning images into texts with speech bubbles, it's, it's teenagers who are using those tools more frequently than adults. Um, but it's something that is prone to be had for quite a long time. So no rules there about how, how, how old they have to be. Tatiana, um, smartphones are a distraction, yes, potentially, uh, but not in the activities you described. Well, yes, they are. They're also a distraction in those activities, so <laughs> in a very positive way. But do be aware of that. And again, I'll, I will repeat my advice, which is that uh, once those smartphones come out in class, they're not going away, so, so be aware of that. And basically, actually, my advice about smartphones is just relax, because you can't really control how students are using smartphones in class. Um, they are using them. Even when we think they're not, they're, they're out. They're under the desks. We can't see them, but they are there. So I think this really is... Um, a lot to be said for thinking hard about how we can get the most out of them rather than trying to uh, prescribe or ban them away at all cost. Um, and also, um, I also want to say that with all of these activities here, I think even, even one activity can sometimes go on too long. I certainly wouldn't, enjoy, I wouldn't recommend combining any of these activities in one particular lesson. I think students' threshold for paying attention to these activities is quite, is quite low, and they can get bored by this fun stuff quite easily, especially in connection with mobile phones. And, and the reason is that what are they doing right before class? What are they doing right after class? They're on their phones. So a lesson which is all about using phones is not really providing anything which is substantially or qualitatively different from what they're doing in their free time anyway, which is why I really do believe uh, one possible danger here could be overuse. So please, maybe this wasn't said clearly enough, but I don't think it's a good idea to fill your class with, with mobile phones. So a little bit towards the end sometimes, just five minutes towards the end uh, is more than enough. Okay, um, thank you for your uh, comments there. I want to let you know that, oh, there should be an image there, but it's not, it's not there. I, I've written a book for ETpedia uh, called Teenagers, and it was just um, published in April. The link at the bottom of the screen here gives you information about how you can find more about it. But it's basically 500 ideas for teenagers. And those, the, the 10 ideas that you've seen today come from this book, but there are 490 other ideas that I recommend to you. And you can also get a 20% discount for a limited time if you name the book, this code ED20. And if you order the book, because a pavilion will post it to you if you order online, you'll be able to get a discount. Um, Delphine, I'm going to pass you back to, well, when I pass you back to Rianne, I think she'll be able to show you a slide that you'd like again, because <laughs> like a true teacher, I'm not sure I can do that uh, while talking at the same time, so I will uh, um, defer on that. Uh, and I'm about ready to wrap up here. So if there, are, if there are no further questions, then I'd like to thank you for being here today and for your valuable time. Hey, Edmund, thank you so much. That was amazing. I've already been uh, working on money, so check out my Facebook and you'll see my first one. Um, <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think it's for all of us. We certainly learned a lot today. Great all right. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this very, like I said, sunny Sunday. It was great to still see a little bit of a <laughs> come out, uh, even though the weather is so good. Now, before we wrap up, for those who were here at the beginning, I have in two weeks, and I have to say, the 28th of October, I'm going to lined up, uh, presented by uh, Jalal Tadbib, bringing honey into the ELT classroom. Uh, it promises to be another amazing webinar, so please don't miss it, and join us on the 28th. I'd also like to remind you guys that the 7th uh, bell today is coming up on the 11th of May 2019, um, and the call for proposals is now open and closes on the 31st of December. Please don't be shy. If you have anything to share with us, and I am sure that you do, and in your proposal, and we would love to take a look at it. All right? I'm going to end the recording. Thank you again uh, for your participation. I hope to see you again in two weeks' time. Okay.